The last collision for us to examine here in lecture is the two-dimensional elastic collision. When it comes to the two-dimensional elastic collision where the objects bounce off of each other or glance off of each other, we never draw out a situation from a reference frame that, say, looks something like this. Like so. We never draw, describe such a situation because drawing it out and describing it mathematically is a mess. Instead, we always set up a very specific reference frame to describe the two-dimensional elastic collision. By definition, we assume that one of those objects is at rest with respect to that reference frame. This is usually referred to as the target. And then the other object, usually called the incident particle, is initially, by definition, moving along the x-axis. So then, therefore, the situation is never drawn like this. Instead, we just draw it like this. Right here is the target. It's initially at rest with respect to this reference frame. And then here's the incident particle. By definition, it's initially coming in along the x-axis like so. And then the two objects glance off of each other or scatter off of each other, as we say. This then results in the following simple diagram. Okay, so now we take a look <clears throat> at the two-dimensional elastic collision. And we always draw it out in the following manner. Here's the first object, like so, initially moving along the x-axis with an initial velocity v2 naught. Here's the second object, like so, initially at rest with respect to this reference frame. And then as you saw me do with the tennis balls, the two objects glance off of each other. So for example, the first object scatters or glances off like so with a final velocity v1 final. And then with respect to the positive x-axis, which is in this direction, this velocity vector forms an angle theta with respect to that direction. This is referred to as a scattering angle. Okay, and then the second object, that then scatters off like so. Right here is its final velocity, v2 final, and then with respect to the positive x-axis, its scattering angle here is usually referred to as phi. So once again, this diagram is describing the following situation where the objects scatter or glance off of each other like so. Now for purposes of lecture, what we're gonna do is just examine one situation. What happens if the objects are of equal mass? So if they're of equal mass, then the incident particle here has a mass m, and the target particle also has a mass m. Only one thing can happen if the two objects are of equal mass. We'll take a look at that situation as an elegant proof. I'll phrase it for us as a problem. Go ahead and copy that problem down into your notes. Prove that the sum of the scattering angles is 90 degrees. In other words, theta plus phi is a 90 degree angle. It's a right angle. Prove that the sum of the scattering angles is 90 degrees for two objects of equal mass undergoing a two-dimensional elastic collision when one of the objects is initially at rest. This is a very elegant proof. So basically what we're asked to do is prove that theta plus phi is equal to 90 degrees. Okay, let's initially begin by setting up conservation of momentum. When I do, however, I, for purposes of this proof, I don't have to break this up into the x direction and the y direction. Instead, I'm gonna leave everything in vector form. So then therefore, our conservation of momentum expression is nothing more than the following. Change of momentum of number one plus change of momentum of number two is equal to zero. And now let's just go ahead and fill in mass times velocity, final minus initial, for each of the two objects. So then therefore the final momentum of object number one right up here is gonna be m times v1 final. Notice I'm leaving this in vector form. And then minus the initial momentum here of the first object, that's m times v1 naught. Okay, and then we have the target, object number two. So right here is its final momentum, m times v2 final. And then minus the initial, which is equal to zero because the target, remember, is always thought of as beginning at rest. Okay, the mass m is common to all terms. It go, we can go ahead now and cancel it out. And then if you take this term here and move it to the other side, you end up with the following expression. Like so. Notice that the two final velocity vectors are adding together here to produce the initial velocity vector. In other words, this equation is vector addition. 
and recall what sort of geometrical shape is traced out when two vectors are added together to form a third. It's a vector triangle. Okay, now using the tail-to-tip method of vector addition, here's what that triangle looks like. So we first of all have V1 final, which is this vector right here. That looks like this. Okay, and then we'll add to it V2 final, that's this vector right here, using the tail-to-tip method of vector addition. That is like so. And this then gives us the resultant. The resultant then therefore is V1 naught, the initial velocity of the first object. That's this vector here, like so. So using the tail-to-tip method of vector addition, conservation of momentum gives us this vector triangle. Okay, now where are the angles on this triangle? Well, first of all, if we look at the diagram above the angle theta, pretty obviously is this angle right here. Remember that V1 naught is initially along the x-axis, so then therefore that angle is theta. Okay, and then we have the angle phi on the diagram above. Okay, right here, let's say that the marker is pointing along the positive x-axis, so then therefore for V2 final, right here is the angle phi on the diagram above. But the marker is parallel to V1 naught. Remember that V1 naught is along the positive x-axis. So then therefore, if this angle here is phi, this then means that this angle right here is phi, like so. Now, in order to prove that theta plus phi is equal to 90 degrees, this then means that this vector triangle has to be a right triangle. But is it? Well, in order to show that it is in fact a right triangle, now we look at the elastic approximation, that is conservation of kinetic energy. So change in kinetic energy of each object added together is equal to zero. So let's go ahead and write out the one-half mv squared. So first of all, for this first object, the final kinetic energy is one-half m v1 final squared, and then minus the initial, one-half m v1 naught squared. And then therefore, for the second object, the final kinetic energy is one-half m v2 final squared, and then minus the initial, which is equal to zero. Recall that the second object begins at rest. Okay, let's go ahead and cancel out the one-half m from each term, like so. And then let's move this term here to the other side. When we do, we obtain this. This expression here. And what is this expression here about this triangle? It's Pythagorean theorem. And then therefore, because that's Pythagorean theorem about this triangle, what can we say about this triangle? It's obviously a right triangle. Therefore, theta plus phi is equal to 90 degrees. The right angle, of course, on this triangle is right here. This is your second strategy when it comes to winning while playing pocket billiards or pool. As long as you don't spin the cue ball, only two things can happen. The first thing is the one-dimensional head-on collision that we looked at in an earlier lecture. The cue ball ends up at rest, and the target ball ends up with the velocity of the cue ball prior to the collision. And then the second thing that can happen is what happens if you glance the cue ball off the target ball? The two balls scatter off of each other such that the sum of the two scattering angles is in fact 90 degrees. Skilled pool players know this. They know the basic physics of the collisions that they set up as they play the game. And then they use the physics of these collisions as they set themselves up from shot to shot as they work their way through a wreck. Every now and then they will have to result, or resort rather, to spinning the cue ball when striking it with the cue. When you spin the cue ball then not only is momentum conserved, but angular momentum is conserved as well, and the physics is much more complicated. But as long as you don't spin the cue ball, you just roll it across the felt, then only one of two different things can happen. The one-dimensional collision and the glancing collision that we've looked at here. Okay, I'll pause this video here at this point. What I want you to do at this point is now take a look at my demonstration video where I use an air table to simulate some two-dimensional elastic collisions.